This is BBC Radio 6 Music. Simply put, the Jesus and Mary Chain are one of the most influential alternative rock bands of all time. From the mid-80s to the mid-90s, they built a bridge between classic underground pop like the Velvet Underground and the Studios over to a whole new distortion-loving alternative rock movement, inspiring bands across the world like My Bloody Valentine and Dinosaur Jr. They were also renowned for the incredibly fractious relationship between the Scottish-born brothers at the core of the group, dual vocalists and guitarists William and Jim Reid. After six albums, including their seminal debut, Psycho Candy, the band split in a fury of drug abuse and increasingly violent arguments in 1999. But they did reform to play a triumphant set for the Coachella Festival in 2007. Now, in the wake of a career retrospective, I spoke to Jim about the band's formation, their turbulent history, their reunion, and the complex and unpredictable relationship that lies at the heart of one of the most volatile rock and roll bands ever. And I started, as is traditional, by asking Jim when he first became aware of music as a child. The first song I can remember uh, is probably She Loves You by The Beatles. Classic start. I remember when I was, uh, you know, I mean, a baby, I'm talking about very, very young. I remember singing uh, She Loves You. I remember singing Yeah, Yeah, Yeah for uh, the adults around. And I remember like, if I did that, I had a little plastic guitar. And if I did that, I got a sweetie. So and probably and, and probably the significance of that is less musical and more to do with the, the fact that I, if I, showed, I learned that if I showed off a little bit, somebody would stick a toffee in my mouth or something. What about the first record you owned, the first, the first, piece, of, uh, first piece of vinyl that was yours, that you possessed? Um, I remember my auntie gave me and William some 45p record tokens, and that, that bought you a single in 1973, and uh, I bought Hellraiser by Sweet. <laughs>
she took me completely. Not surprised with her ultrasonic eyes, the refreshing like hysterical. Danger signs is everywhere when you try to you'll go out of your head. William wasn't his first record, but uh, he bought uh, Drive-In Saturday by David Bowie. And both of those records have kind of been important to me. Obviously, Hellraiser was my first record, but I remember listening to Drive-In Saturday, and I remember sort of... I mean, that record, I I, I had no idea what the song was about. I mean, to be honest with you, I still don't know what it's about, but... um, I loved the, the the kind of like sort of dreamlike, you know, sort of strange, sort of you know, probably druggy, but I didn't understand that at the age of twelve. And it wasn't like years later when I was like travelling around America in a band, and I'd be like, and I remember like lying in a hotel room about five in the morning, like a zombie staring at the TV and just flicking from one channel to another, and then I just remember thinking. Driving Saturday. <laughs> this is Driving Saturday. This is like I, I swear David Bowie must have written that song on a tour of America while he was doing too much of stuff that was bad for his health. <laughs> Babe, it'll be all right Pour me out another phone I'll ring and see if your friends are home Perhaps the strange ones in the dome Can lend us a book We can meet up alone And try to get it on like once before When people stand in Jagger's eyes Enough to keep formation Mid this fallout saturation Cursing at the astronaut That stands in steel by his cabinet He's crashing out with Sylvia Euro supply for aging men With snorting head He gazes to the shore
first gig you went to did that have a similar impact well, i went to see the jam at the glasgow apollo how was that oh that was great i mean it was it was loud i, I just remember that I, I thought my ears were bleeding i mean it was so so bloody loud i couldn't believe it i mean first gig i had no idea what to expect but i just didn't think it was going to be that loud and i remember for days afterwards i was like whoa you're going, Jim, do you want a cup of tea? Like, hey, what? And it was like, it was just, it was amazing. It was like, that's, that was it. That's, you know, so I kind of like, uh, there and then thought, well, that's what I want to do for a living. I want to make people's ears bleed.
So was it the gig more than maybe recording music that inspired you to make you think that that's what I want to do? Well, I mean, if I think back to it, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, w w there was a point where I remember like, that, that, that I had decided that music was going to be important to me. And it's back to Sweet again. I remember listening to the, the Top 40 rundown on a little transistor radio just outside my house, probably about, oh, I, don't, I can't remember, 73 or whatever, and listening, it was Blockbuster was number one. And I remember listening to Blockbuster on that little transistor radio, and I remember I got, it was the first time I'd ever got like a, like a shiver up my spine, and the hair stood up in the back of my neck, I mean, it could have been that it was Scotland and it was winter, but but no, it was like, it was. The, I mean, basically, if music was my religion, you know, that's when I found God at that moment. I mean, basically, that record just sounded... I, then I just thought, well, I want to do this. I want to be in a band. Uh, and then it wasn't until, like, years later, I suppose, with, like, yeah, stuff like The Jam and Punk, that all of these kind of out-of-focus, diffused elements like that that I realised were important so I came into focus and it was punk that made me realise well me and William realised that we were going to um, one day make music but you know we're the laziest people on earth so we ran out and uh, bought guitars and they sat in the corner of the bedroom for about five years and we sat downstairs talking about starting a band did you draw logos and stuff and all that kind of stuff? We, we, weren't, we weren't quite that sad, but <laughs> all right, Christ, we did, okay. You mentioned the impact of, um, of seeing the jam and punk. What about, uh, kind of, I suppose, proto-punk would be uh, an apt genre description? Uh, can you remember the first time you heard, you heard the Stooges? The Stooges, I mean, I'd heard of the Stooges before I actually heard them because basically every punk band on the planet talked about them. And then we went out and bought Raw Power. And it was just, it just sort of blew, blew us away. I mean, the cover was brilliant. I mean, the picture on the cover, you could buy it for that alone and you'd be getting your money's worth. But the music was just like fabulous. It's not a, not a duff track. I mean, there's eight tracks on it, I think. But, uh, you know, any one of those tracks is like sort of worth it for the price alone. It's just a brilliant record. I mean, just like, I just like, it was the first time that I think I bought an album where you didn't want to lift a needle up from start to finish. You're waiting on the next track. You're like, oh, every track sort of does its job. First band then, because you weren't Jesus and Mary Chain straight away. Um, yeah, it was a Jesus and Mary Chain straight away. That, that? that was our first band. First rehearsal? There wasn't just a pair of you in the corner of the living room. We used to rehearse in this little um, <laughs> uh, community centre in East Kilbride and. Uh, We'd no, you know, we'd no transport. The, the only way we had it was about half a mile away, and the only way we could get the gear there was we stuck sort of casters onto the bottom of the amps. <laughs> it was like me, William, and Douglas sort of like wheeling all with these amplifiers down the street to the community centre, you know, to rehearse. And it was like community centre was like free, and it's like I don't know, we'd be in there Tuesday nights, like Wednesday nights it'd be like sort of Blue Rinse Brigade playing bingo or something like that. Tuesday nights it'd be the Jesus and Mary Chain in rehearsal and stuff. Did it feel like, did it feel exciting as soon as you started putting it in the framework of we are this band, we have this name? I think, yeah, I think once we kind of actually got together and started rehearsing, I mean it took, as I said, it took a long time for us to get to that point, but once we did, I think we started to get you know, into it more and start to realise that this was actually going to, well, we thought it was going to happen. So, yeah, as soon as we started rehearsing, and I think it, that when William came up with the name, and when, when we had the name, that was it. it. Somehow, it just, like, after that, it was like, it just kind of, it was like a train, it just wouldn't stop. What was the first gig like? Well, I mean, it was all right. I mean, we, it was like, yeah, we, we couldn't get a gig in Glasgow. It was just like such a kind of like insular little music scene there. It was all kind of hip sway and, you know, guys, everybody seemed to have at one point been in a lot of images or something like that. No harm to them, but we just seemed, we couldn't get our foot in the door. Nobody would give us a gig. And then we kind of hooked up with Bobby Gillespie, who had a... A mate in London, Alan McGee, that, that was doing a record label and it had a club called The Living Room, so I think it was more as a favour to Bobby that Alan sort of booked us to play The Living Room. And we went down and we were something like third on the bill, I think it was Micro Disney or the headline. 
And uh, when we went on to play, there was about six people watching us. And I remember I didn't care, six people watching us, but we were on a stage and we were playing in front of people. And it was like, you know, and during the day, we'd sort of, for the first time we'd met McGee. McGee, I, I think he just thought we were like sort of psychos or something like that. It's like 10 minutes after meeting him, me and William started like lunging at each other because we hadn't been getting on that day. It was a hot day. We were getting on each other's nerves. McGee, sort of, we just introduced ourselves and then started swinging at each other. Me and William, he thought, these guys are nuts. And then we did the sound check and he just started raving about like, album deals and blah, 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 five albums. And yeah, it's amazing, it's genius. And that was it. Tell me about the first single. Well, we had no idea how to go about recording in a proper studio. Um, we went in in the middle of the night because it was cheaper. We were all kind of like a bit tanked up, got down there with a big stack of beers, which was probably a mistake. Uh, we started mixing on the big bloody Tannoy speakers, which, you know, it sounded like, we were like, whoa, do we, look, I can't believe we sound that good. And then we saw it up all night, you know, tinkering around with it. And then we sort of went away home, stuck the tape in a ghetto blaster, and it sounded like crap. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, last night we sounded like the Velvets. Today we sound like Dire Straits. What's going on? You know, it's like, you know, somebody said, well, did you mix it on those big bloody Tannoys? And I'm like, yeah. So I said, well, you've got to go back and mix it on a little radio speaker in the middle, which is uh, what we did. But um, we decided that, there was too many people, too many cooks, so William and Alan went back to remix it. Because uh, where we were mixing it, I mean, it was that classic, you know, everybody in the band wanted their bit up louder stuff. So we decided it would be better if we uh, kept it to McGee and my brother. <laughs> You mentioned the Velvets there, actually, which is obviously another one of the kind of touchstones. When did you first fall in love with them? Well, again, that was another one of those bands that all the 
the punk bands name checked and uh, we'd bought Transformer but hadn't heard anything by the Velvets and I remember uh, I remember hearing I'm waiting for the man uh, when I was in the bath I used to always hear songs for the first time when I was in the bath because I used to always play the radio when I was in the bath and it came on one Saturday afternoon when I was in the bathtub and I was like <gasps> Hey white boy What you doing uptown Hey white boy You chasing all women around Oh pardon me sir It's furthest from my mind Listening to the first time with Jim Reed from the Jesus and Mary Chain. Six Music. BBC Six Music. Yes, 
I'm Matt Everett, and you're listening to The First Time with Jim Reed from the Jesus and Mary chain. And that was the Mary chain's Everything is Alright When You're Down. I asked Jim whether the band's first trip to the US in 1985 was something of a culture shock. It was as if we'd... We knew it. You know, it was almost like... You know, I mean, basically the America that we were interested in was gone, really. I mean, the bands like the Velvets and the Stooges, that was ancient history, really. But America, I mean... it went to New York in March 1985, signed off the dole in January. It was just like, whoa, you know? And it was like New York was just exactly like the way I thought New York was going to be. It was kind of dirty and sleazy and, and fun. And it was just, it was like, it was like uh, every second of that trip was like a party, really, you know? And it, I mean, it was weird. I mean, I, I, I still not really quite sure how it all came about, but we went there to play club the danceteria and we played two nights there and i hadn't really realized it at the time but uh, i mean basically we were brought over the promoter ruth polsky that used to bring loads of english british bands over to play in new york the first gigs but i didn't I hadn't realized it was going to be like a club <laughs> i thought these people were actually coming to see the mary chain and i was like so I walked out there and i thought this is pretty cool i couldn't even imagine these people could know we exist and that was the first night and it all went pretty well the second night, it was like people were breakdancing. <laughs> it was like they were really was just spinning around the floor and breakdancing. I was like, oh, no, something's not right here. And it's like we started cranking out the noise and people just like, so it was like that bit in the producers when everybody's jaw dropped, you know. <gasps> but um, yeah, it was fun. You always seem to have quite an affinity with the States, though, in terms of your fan base and... A lot. I mean, a lot of the things... Uh, that, that we were interested in sort of like cultural landmarks I guess were American you know sort of movies like Taxi Driver or you know sort of books by William Burroughs or you know certainly music by the you know, Velvets uh, Stooges Suicide and um, New York Dolls Ramones I mean yeah a lot a lot of the things that set us on our road were American I mean a lot a lot a lot of those things weren't. I mean, we're into sort of British punk and British culture too, but um, there was a kind of a version of America that we were fascinated with. How long were you playing for live at the time? This is one of the other kind of myths that all <sighs> surrounds the band in terms of these very short 20, 25 minute sets. We did do a couple of very short sets, not as many as people say. I mean, basically, when people were paying peanuts to see see the band, we figured we could do what the hell we wanted. Uh, we didn't play 15-minute sets by the time it sort of got for real, if you know what I mean. I mean, the, the idea wasn't even ours. I mean, we'd... I mean, we'd heard about it from the fire engines and stuff like that, and we just sort of thought, well, that, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, you, like, you go out there and you, why bore people to death? Go out, you've got this, like, sort of manic noise. It's not going to... I mean, this isn't Bruce Springsteen here. It's not going to work for, like, two and a half hours. So go out there and make it like an explosion, and, you know, just leave people in a state of shock. And that was the thinking, and it worked. I mean, it really did work. I mean, you went out there... We just basically exploded, blew up in people's faces, and people would never forget that band again. I have to ask about your first Pill session, it being Six Music. We are the keepers of the John Peel legacy. That's always a fantastic moment in any band's life. It was. It was great. I mean... Uh, what do you remember from the day? Uh, well, I mean, the actual recording of it wasn't, wasn't ideal, to be honest with you. I mean... Uh, I remember, like, try to talk the engineers into, you know, like, certain things that they weren't so keen on us doing. Turning it up and turning it up. Turning well, it up one turning of the things up, we wanted to do, <laughs> we wanted to record broken glass and they wouldn't let us. We wanted to break bottles and record it. Health and, and safety, mate, can't do that. <laughs> and we were saying, but look, 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 there was a big oil drum in the corner and we said, look, do it inside the oil drum, glass goes nowhere, stick it in there with a mic. But they wouldn't do that and that was a bit unfortunate, but... um so what? I mean, we got to record four tracks for John Peel. And it was great. And I remember when it was broadcast, I was back in East School Bride. And I, I took my dog for a walk with a wee transistor radio uh, while it was on. And I remember just walking around East School Bride thinking, this is weird. <laughs> I'm on the radio. And I stopped at a supermarket. And there were people in there, sort of like a, and security guys that were like, that were in there listening to the radio and I was looking in the window at them listening to John Peel. 
and like, like playing like the Mary chain, sort of like getting a, a strange feeling about it, you know.
Skies off your second record at uh, Darklands was your first top 10 hit as a band who's always loved uh, pop as well as or the, 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 the art of pop as well as kind of punk did it mean a lot to have a top 10 single it was yeah I mean it did I mean I, I sort of grew up watching Top of the Pops T-Rex like Bowie on Top of the Pops Slade Sweet you know I loved it and that's what we wanted to be and that's what we wanted to do and uh, and I love punk, but it, it kind of disappointed me when bands like The Pistols and The Clash wouldn't do Top of the Pops, because I wanted to see them on Top of the Pops, you know. And uh, you know, other punk bands did, and it was great. The Ramones on Top of the Pops, The Buzzcocks, The Saints, it was fabulous, and that's where I wanted to be. Didn't you get banned from Top of the Pops once? Um, the, I mean, not really. I mean, I think there was some candy talking. Uh, almost got banned by the BBC. <laughs> Mike Smith uh, wouldn't play it or something like that. And uh, but and we sort of said, "Well, is it banned?" And he was like, "No, no, I'm just not playing it." If he had a band, it would have gone to number one, but he didn't. <laughs> band like around that time around the you know reverence time was it starting to get harder work around about well reverence and honey's dead i mean we kind of 
we kind of felt a little bit kind of like outsiders by that time. The whole kind of like Manchester thing had happened and we didn't really know where we fit anymore. And we'd been kind of struggling to get radio play and, I mean, the time of day generally. And uh, we kind of just almost like just sort of thought, well, who cares? And we just like stuck out reverence as a single, just expecting it would sink without a trace. But um, it did all right. Was there a point when the drinking and the drug taking, you thought this is this is getting out of control? This is this is going to be damaging to the band as well as maybe our, our health. Was there a point when you started to think in those terms? I mean, yeah. I mean, I always kind of knew that it couldn't go on like that. You know, I always. I mean, I it was probably the mid nineties was probably when it got uh, at its you know sort of most out of control. Um, yeah, and I, and I thought, well, one day I'll sort this out. And it's just that that day just kept getting sort of further ahead of me. And I did eventually, I haven't had a drink for five years now, so, I mean, I consider myself sorted out in that respect. But it was, it was getting out of control. It was out of control. On a subject of out of control, the House of Blues in 1998 which is which is one of those gigs that's passed into legend there's lots of legends that seem to surround you guys so what happened oh, i mean is that the sigh of a man that's told this story too many times well no it's just it's painful to remember it to be honest with you um i do, i mean it, I, we weren't getting along we hadn't been for quite a long time the recording of monkey was like sort of going to the dentist for you know for two months or something like that it ended up with Monkey that he went in and recorded all of his songs with the rest of the band. I went in and sort of recorded my songs with the band. It wasn't a band anymore, you know. It could have been, and you know, I've said often that you know someone should have really been around us. Someone should have spotted this and said, "Well, send them, you know, opposite directions, get them away from each other for a while." And it'll probably sort itself out. But instead, somebody booked us into a big bloody world tour. <laughs> so that was it. So there you have it. We are we're sitting in the back of a tour bus in America. We can't stand the sight of each other, and it, you know, it's this little claustrophobic space that we have to share. And it, we got about two dates into that tour. It came. It blows. I mean, it actually, the, the House of Blues. What happened was. We actually came to blows in, in a van on the way back from the gig the night before House of Blues, and William said, well, that's it, I'll play tomorrow's gig and I'm out of here. And that just, like, you know, I spent the whole day, basically I didn't go to bed that night, spent the whole day just getting absolutely rat assed and what have you. Uh, by the time the gig came, I couldn't stand up. I, you know, I mean, I just couldn't stand up, and I just remember, I mean, it was memories of just ranting and raving at William on stage, but in front of the audience, and then basically the promoter just said, this is not music, pulled the plugs, gave everybody their money back. I mean, that's the only time. I mean, we played some pretty uh, messed up shows, but that was the only time we ever actually had to give the audience their money back. That was it. And I had to do the rest of the tour with the band without William. That must have been very difficult. It was, it was, it was very strange. And I remember the night, the next gig, it was, it was a most bizarre gig you can imagine. I don't know how come it happened or how we got booked. We got booked into this, like, supper club somewhere. Like, I can't remember where it was, in San Diego or something like that. And we had a first gig without William, feeling all fragile and frazzled. And I walk out and there's people eating steaks and sort of, like, sort of like linguine in the front row. And I'm like, what's going on? It's like spinal tap. When did you first decide or think of the idea that a reunion was going to take place? Uh, people had been trying to get us back together for quite a while and it was uh, the Coachella people they, they just kept in, they kept coming at us and at first said absolutely no way why? well I just I didn't think he'd be interested William and uh, he was the same he sort of thought I wouldn't go for it and then we kind of talked about it and I sort, sort of said well I thought you weren't keen and then he was like yeah well, should we go for it and that was it what was the first gig like then? The first gig was terrifying. <laughs> it was uh, it was the first time I'd played with the Mary Chain sober. I mean, that was terrifying enough. You know, it was just like we'd, we'd 
we had this club gig, I think the day before uh, Coachella, and we played it and it went well without a hitch. And then, and then I mean, being Mr. Pessimist, I was, I was like, oh, for Christ's sake, we shouldn't have booked that gig because you now this one's going to be a disaster. I was nervous, I was shaking, but I don't think it showed. And, um, and it all went well. How's your relationship now? It's not ideal, and it never will be, but um, we can, we kind of know how to handle each other a bit better now. Why do you say it never will be? Because just too much has happened, you know, just too much has happened that can't be undone. I mean, basically, for things to be the way they once were between me and William, you'd have to go back in time and destroy the Jesus and Mary chain, really, you know? For a while, we were almost like sort of Siamese twins at the beginning of the band, but that, that quickly, you know, that, that, that went. And then it was like we were just basically fighting for space in this little confined space called the Mary Chain. That's what it was. It was just like, I don't know, 10, 15 years of sort of like fighting for your own little bit of ground. We finish with, it's been all these firsts and all these firsts. We finish with the last. This is the last track where you can play anything you'd like. It's your choice. It can be something of yours. It can be something that means a lot to you, new or old. Well, I'll play something by someone else. I'll play um, Beasley Street by John Cooper Clark. Why that track? Well, I just have always loved it. And uh, it's another one of those songs that I heard for the first time in the bath. Uh, I, I just think that, you know, every line in this song is like a punch. You know, it just there's nothing, nothing's wasted. It's it's really it's 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 something I wish I could have done. It's just a, a, a wonderful record. It's been really good to speak to you. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks a lot. Far from crazy pavements, the taste of silver spoons, a clinical arrangement on a dirty afternoon. Where the fecal germs of Mr. Freud are rendered obsolete. The legal term is null and void in the case of Beasley Street. In the cheap seats where murder breeds, somebody is out of breath. Sleep is a luxury they don't need, a sneak preview of death. Belladonna is your flower, manslaughter your meat, spend a year in a couple of hours on the edge of Beasley Street, where the action isn't, that's where it is, state your position, vacancies exist. In an ex-certificate exercise Ex-servicemen excrete Keith Joseph smiles and a baby dies In a box on Beasley Street From the boarding houses and the bed sits Full of accidents and fleas Somebody gets it Where the missing persons freeze Wearing dead men's overcoats You can't see their feet A rift joint shuts Opens up right down on Beasley Street Cars collide, colours clash Disaster movie stuff For a man with a Fu Manchu moustache Revenge is not enough there's a dead canary on a swivel seat There's a rainbow in the road Meanwhile on Beasley Street Silence is the cold Hot beneath the collar An inspector calls where the perishing stink of squalor impregnates the walls. The rats have all got rickets. They spit through broken teeth. The name of